Hi, everyone. I hope everyone had a great weekend and enjoyed the, uh, the rain yesterday. Um, a couple of reminders. Uh, homework 3 is due on Wednesday. The optional homework 4 will come out on Wednesday. Um, also, for people who are remote and on Zoom, um, so far, I think everyone has been asking questions through chat, but I wanted to kind of have a quick reminder that uh, if you want to, instead of asking a question via chat, uh, you could also raise your hand on Zoom. And when I call on you, we should be able to hear you verbally if you want to ask verbal questions. Cool. Um, so today we're going to be talking about meta reinforcement learning. And we're going to be talking about the problem statement for meta reinforcement learning. And then we're going to be talking about two classes of methods black box meta RL methods and optimization based meta RL methods. Um, black box meta RL methods are going to come up in homework four. Um, and then on Wednesday, we're also going to talk about meta RL, but we're going to talk about a specific part of the meta RL problem statement, which is learning how to explore. Um, and this will really be the focus of homework four, but these methods will use kind of some of the basics in black box meta RL. And then the goals of the lecture will be to really try to understand the problem statement of meta RL, um, how it differs from kind of standard meta learning, as well as understand the basics of black box and optimization based meta RL methods. Cool. Um, so as a little bit of recap, uh, previously we talked about reinforcement learning algorithms as a um, as kind of a, a primer on a lot of what we'll talk about today. We also talked about multitask RL. Um, and we introduced both model-free methods as well as model-based methods. And we kind of saw this kind of overall anatomy of a reinforcement learning algorithm where you collect some data, you estimate return in some way, and then you use that to improve your behavior. Uh, and of course, one of the things that's pretty different about I guess there's two things that are different about RL compared to supervised learning. One is that you collect your own data, and the second is that instead of giving, getting direct labels, you're given reward feedback. Um, and this changes how the learning algorithm operates. And so we saw a few different ways for estimating the return, um, directly through Monte Carlo, or fitting a value function to estimate re reward, as well as just estimating the dynamics of the environment. And then we also saw ways to use these estimates of the return to improve your behavior through policy gradient, through um, kind of taking the argmax of your value function, and also through planning with your model. Great. Um, and then before we talked about reinforcement learning, we also talked about these different problem settings, including multitask learning, transfer learning, and meta learning. Um, and all of these different scenarios, the tasks have to share some amount of structure. And what we'll really be looking at today is how we can look at the meta-learning problem in a reinforcement learning scenario, where our goal is to quickly learn a new reinforcement learning task, given experience from previous reinforcement learning tasks. And one thing that's going to be different is that instead of just given data from these tasks, we're actually going to have to collect the data from each of the training tasks ourselves. OK, um, and then we saw that a reinforcement learning task corresponds to a Markov decision process with a state space and action space, essentially the, um, the domain of the problem, um, the initial state distribution, the dynamics of how the environment evolves over time, as well as the reward function. Um, and we saw that generally any of these things can vary across tasks, although in general, the dynamics and the reward are often the things that are changing uh, across tasks. And so meta reinforcement learning is essentially going to correspond to meta learning, but with reinforcement learning tasks. And where essentially we need to collect data from our training tasks in a way that allows us to solve a new task through exploration and adaptation in that new MDP. Cool. So concretely what this looks like is um, before we talked about the meta learning problem, um, we saw supervised learning and then we saw how meta learning is essentially trying to kind of take as input a small amount of data for a new supervised learning problem and a new example and leverage the data in order to effectively predict the label for the test example. Um, so this was meta supervised learning. We did this with a data set of data sets across all of our tasks where each data set has input output pairs. And uh, this view is useful because it essentially reduces the problem of meta-learning to learning something that takes as input a data set and makes predictions about new examples. 
Now in meta reinforcement learning, we're no longer going to, going to be trying to solve supervised learning tasks. Uh, instead, we want to learn a policy. So our input is going to be a state st. Our policy is going to output which action should be taken at that state. And so generally we'll be learning this policy that maps from states to actions. Um, and in reinforcement learning, instead of having input output pairs, you're instead given, or you instead have experience in that MDP that has states, actions, rewards, and next states. And so we're not told directly what to do, we're just given rewards for behaviors that are good, and we try to maximize the rewards for those behaviors. Um, so this should mostly be review up until now. And in meta reinforcement learning, uh, we want to be able to quickly solve a, a reinforcement learning task. And so it's going to be quite analogous to the meta supervised learning scenario. But um, our training data is not going to be input output pairs. It's now going to be experience collected in a reinforcement learning task. And you can think of it as k episodes from running your, some policy pi, um, or k rollouts from pi. And we want to be able to use k rollouts from some policy in order to maximize reward in that MDP, and k might be very small. Uh, typically in reinforcement learning, you may require a lot of experience. We want to be able to solve a new task with a very small amount of experience. And so given this experience, um, we then want to be able to map from states to actions and be able to quickly learn how to solve a new MDP from just these k rollouts. Now, the data for this, um, we'll again have a data set of data sets um, that's collected for each task. But uh, one thing that will be different is that we won't necessarily just be given these data sets. This is the data from each of these tasks actually has to be collected ourselves through the meta reinforcement learning process. Okay. So now the key parts of this problem is that we have to figure out how to design and optimize F. Uh, this, we saw this uh, before, and actually we'll talk a lot about this today and how this differs a little bit in the reinforcement learning setting. Uh, and then we also need to learn how to collect appropriate data. So we need to collect all of the DIs, we also need to learn what policy pi will help us collect informative data for solving the MDP. And so essentially we need to learn how to explore. Um, and this is usually pretty important because if you just run a random policy, for example, that might not give you informative information about the task. And if you have a good exploration policy, then this should allow you to very quickly infer the task. So you both need a good exploration strategy here, as well as a good adaptation strategy in F data. Cool. Um, and the other thing that I'll, I'll note here is that your exploration policy pi doesn't necessarily need to be the same as the policy that actually adapts to the task, which is represented by F. So we can look at a, an example. So say we want to learn how to quickly navigate in a new maze. So we collected some experience in a maze. So maybe we just had one episode, so k equals one. And we collected some experience that's shown in this trajectory that goes from red eventually to blue. And the goal is to get to the, the blue box. And you don't necessarily see, that you, the agent only sees where it kind of locally is in the maze. It doesn't actually see the whole picture of the maze. And so given this training data, the single episode in the MDP, we want to be able to ultimately get a policy that can then directly go to the goal and directly solve the MDP very quickly. Um, so this is what we'd like to be able to do. So this would correspond to meta test time. And then what we want to do during meta training is to prepare ourselves for solving this meta test task. And so um, if, if this is what we want to be able to do, then what we can do is we can, at meta train time, practice solving lots of different kinds of mazes. So we can um, collect data in different tasks where different mazes correspond to different tasks and learn how to solve each of these mazes so that when we're given a new maze at test time, we can very quickly learn how to navigate in that maze with maybe just a single episode. 
Um, and of course, uh, here the example of a different task corresponds diff to different mazes, but the different task could be something different as well. Yeah, so the question is, can you have multiple exploration policies when you're collecting data? Um, when you collect your training data in, in an MDP, you, um, it could really be whatever you want. I, I guess I listed a single policy that could also be a mixture of multiple different policies such that you collect data um, according to that mixture of policies. Um, the other thing is that the exploration policy can also be recurrent, and so it can incorporate its experience in the maze so far when determining how to continue to explore in that maze. Okay, and then one more note about the meta RL problem is that um, this is the formulation that I discussed before. I'll refer to this as like the episodic variant of meta RL, where you're given k episodes from pi. But the training data could also be corresponding to um, k time steps from your policy. You could essentially learn in a more kind of online fashion when you're given even less data from pi rather than k episodes, you have k time steps. Um, and, and like I mentioned before, the exploration policy and the adaptation policy don't necessarily need to be the same. Cool, any questions on the problem statement? Okay, so essentially what we did is we just took the meta-learning problem and replaced the tasks with MDPs. So how do we actually go about solving this problem statement? Um, we're gonna look at two different kinds of approaches, black box approaches and optimization-based approaches. Um, we're actually not going to talk at all about non-parametric methods. Um, and I'm curious if anyone has thoughts on why that's the case or why it would be difficult to apply non-parametric meta-learning methods to meta-RL. Yeah? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So in, with non-parametric methods, they're really designed for classification problems where you are trying to classify among a few different classes. Um, in general, when you're trying to predict actions, uh, sometimes those actions might be continuous, in which case it's more of a regression problem and you just can't solve it at all with, with non-parametric methods. Um, and even in cases where you do have a discrete action space, it isn't really analogous to this concept of class. It's more analogous to like, which of these actions should you take? Um, it seems possible that you could apply non-parametric methods to meta-RL when you have discrete actions, um, but thus far they haven't been used at all because you don't really have this notion of class. And it's not really a nearest neighbors problem anymore. It's more a problem of using your experience to figure out how to solve new environments. and. Um, you can't really apply this sort of idea of matching um, or nearest neighbors to solve these kinds of problems. Okay, so we'll start with black box methods. And um, in black box meta learning before, we saw that we can essentially take this form where we have a function that takes as input our data as well as our new test input and predicts the corresponding label. And in general, the trend will almost be the same in RL, where we take as input a data set, as well as a new state that we're observing, and we're going to predict the corresponding action for that state. Um, so for example, our black box model could be a recurrent neural network that takes as input um, some of our training data seen so far, and as well as our query data point, ST, and then predicts the corresponding action. Now, one thing that you can note here is that the training data is actually going to be getting larger over time. It's essentially going, like, at every single time step, we're just adding to our training data. Um, and so it's going to be incrementally growing and essentially growing on a rolling basis where kind of your query set at um, the current time step will then actually become part of the training data set at the next time step. And, um, yeah, so you can... View it as essentially a recurrent policy. It takes as input the states and the rewards so that it can infer what the task is from that experience in order to figure out what to do at the current state. 
So now I have a couple questions for you. Um, one thing you might notice here is that we're passing in the states and the rewards, <clears throat> but we're not passing in the actions. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on why we don't need to pass in the actions in, in with the support set? Mm -hmm. um, in the action from the previous time step, and to look at the markup property, like the new condition on that, it doesn't contribute to any initial information. So you're saying that the. Um, it doesn't contribute any additional information? And given like the, the state that you're in, then, that you transitioned to, the action should matter. So you're saying that given the state that you transitioned into, um, the past actions don't matter because of the Markov property. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you, you know what you're, you see the state that you're in, um, and that, does, like, you, that tells you essentially about your previous action. That's sort of right. Um, any more to add? The output of the other students, the action that we start in the Yeah, so the other thing is that the, Policy is actually predicting the actions itself. And so its hidden state is actually going to contain information about the previous action. And so because the hidden state already contains all the information that's needed to predict that action, then the action information is actually already stored, and you don't need to pass it in as input again. Um, and one reason why that information is important is that even dis despite the Markov property, it is helpful to have those previous actions because if different tasks vary based on different dynamics, then you actually want to know information about SAS prime, about what the dynamics are. Um, and so it is actually important to have that, to know that action information, because it allows you to identify differences in the dynamics. Um, but the hidden state already captures it because um, the hidden state is what was used to generate that action. Okay. Um, and then the other question is, uh, how is this different from just doing like standard reinforcement learning with a recurrent policy? Um, so it is quite similar to just doing standard RO with the recurrent policy, but there are a couple differences, and I'm curious if anyone can spot any of them. Yeah? In running R, with the recurrent policy, we don't pass like previous remark. Yeah, so one thing is typically in standard RL, we don't pass in the previous reward function at each time step, we just pass in the state. Um, and so this is one thing that's different. Good. Any other things that are different? So the, I guess the first thing that I had here is that the reward is passed as input. We're also training this RNN across multiple MDPs rather than within a single MDP. And therefore the rewards might actually, this is one reason why you might need to pass in the rewards as input. Also I can note that if the rewards are the same across tasks and the only thing that's different is the dynamics, then you don't actually need to pass in the reward. Any other differences? So one other thing that's pretty important is that if you want to learn across episodes, if you want this, system, this thing to kind of take as input, um, incorporate a training data set that isn't just like a single episode, but is actually multiple episodes, then it's really important to maintain your hidden state across different episodes in your task. And so one of the things that's really different about kind of doing RL with the standard recurrent policy is that typically you're just going to be maintaining your hidden state within an episode. Whereas here, um, you're actually going to be not resetting your hidden state at the beginning of each episode. You're only going to be resetting it at the beginning of each task. Um, and it's going to try to essentially aggregate information about the task across these different episodes um, so that it can essentially gain as much information and knowledge about the current task as possible. Yeah? The mix plot doesn't imply the hidden states are maintained. Yeah, so this particular plot doesn't necessarily imply it unless the dot, dot, dot kind of includes, um, includes additional episodes. Uh, I have another diagram that, that illustrates this more explicitly. So um, here, say your episodes are 10 or t time steps long, then you are going to have an arrow that continues that hidden state between the boundary of t to zero 
Um, and then once you get to the end of the last episode, you will then, so you, this will have two episodes. If you only have two episodes, then you'll kind of cut off at that point and then start the new episode for the new task um, at time step zero. Yeah. What's the purpose of having episodes, the concept of episodes now, if like we're treating tasks with a new time to zero? Yeah, so the question is, what's the point of having different episodes now, given that we're now kind of sort of treating different tasks as different episodes? And one of the things that's important here is that S1 is going to be kind of drawn again from the initial state distribution. And so uh, when you're exploring in your MDP, it can help be helpful to kind of sample multiple times from the initial state distribution and so, so, like sample multiple possible trajectories. And so we're going to essentially have this notion of episodes and maybe even a notion of kind of meta episode or trial that captures all of the episodes within a single task. Um, and sometimes the literature refers to that as trial. I've also seen it sometimes referred to as meta episode because it captures multiple episodes within a task. Yeah. Isn't this challenging to optimize because then like depending on the order in which the algorithm sees the episode, it can be like either very easy or extremely difficult to learn across episodes. Yeah, so the question is, isn't this very difficult to optimize because like essentially we need to like remember a lot and we need to remember like all the way back from the first episode and if you have a lot of episodes, um, then you essentially like learning things from the earlier episodes might be very difficult. Um, this is a great question. Uh, we'll talk about this in a slide or two, but there are a couple architectures that aren't recurrent networks that will that can potentially aggregate information in a way that isn't like this sequential. And those kinds of architectures can help the optimization a lot. Um, you can think of, for example, things like transformers um, or things like things that kind of take the episode information and then average it into a single embedding. That's going to make it easier to backpropagate into the first episode, for example. Um, there are pros and cons to, to each approaches, but some of those architectures make it easier to optimize. Cool, so as an algorithm, what this looks like is we first sample a task um, from our kind of the set of tasks that we have. Then we're going to roll out this recurrent policy for up to N episodes, where N is basically the kind of the horizon of the learning problem. Um, and as I mentioned before, this D train is going to kind of be updated incrementally with each time step. It's not actually, it's no longer fixed. It's actually growing online. Then um, this will be under the dynamics and the reward for task I. And then we'll store the data that we collected in some replay buffer for that task. And then we can update the policy by sampling data from that replay buffer to essentially just max, like, optimize this recurrent policy so that it maximizes reward over all of your tasks. Um, and this, this last step can be done with a variety of different learning algorithms. It could be done with policy gradients. It could be done with, um, with uh, like Q-learning based methods, for example, as well. Um, so I was trying to keep this general in the sense that it can be applied with a few different approaches. And then of course you also repeat this process once you update your policy, you'll, you'll then collect data um, for another task, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, is it important for the reward functions between tasks to be sort of in the same uh, magnitude for the values? Yeah, for good question. So the question is, um, does, is it important for the reward function to be in the same value for different tasks? Um, in general, this is quite important because um, if they are on very different magnitudes, then when you do this last step, it's going to care a lot more about the task that has a higher magnitude reward than about tasks that have lower magnitude rewards. Um, and so if you want it to ultimately be able to adapt to all of the tasks in the task distribution, you generally want them to have similar magnitudes. Cool. Okay, so that's how what happens at meta training time. And then once you learn this kind of recurrent policy that can learn how to adapt to a task, then at meta test time, you're given a new task and you simply just take the policy that you learned 
and roll out that policy for kind of the horizon of the learning problem. Generally, you don't want to roll it out for more than n episodes because if you roll out an RNN, for example, for longer than the horizon that it was trained, that it may not perform well. Um, although one thing that you could do is something, something where you try to freeze the behavior um, that you get at, at episodes and no longer update that policy and just keep on running that policy. Uh, but if you do really care about like learning for n episodes and then c continuing to kind of execute that policy, you can also optimize for that behavior during meta training. Okay, um, and then to touch a little bit on architectures and optimizers for this, um, the approach of using black box meta RL is quite general, but you can, there's of course lots of different design choices you can choose. Um, so uh, one of the first uh, approaches for this is uh, referred to as RL squared because they're trying to do fast reinforcement learning via slow reinforcement learning. And they essentially did exactly what we talked about on the previous slide where they had this recurrent neural network that takes as input um, states and, and rewards and is able to predict the, um, the next action. And uh, in these two papers, they used uh, policy gradient methods, TRPO and, and A3C. Um, instead of using a recurrent neural network, you can also use an attention-based architecture that has kind of connections from the current time step all the way back to that first time step. And these methods are going to be better at kind of propagating across very long sequences. Um, this particular architecture was alternating between attention and 1D convolutions, um, but you could also have like a purely attention-based architecture as well. Um, and then they were again optimizing the policy with TRPO, which is a policy gradient method. Um, and then the last architecture that I'll mention is um, something more analogous to uh, an architecture that we saw before, where we essentially encode all of our transitions into, a, um, into some embedding, and then we average that embedding, and then pass that averaged embedding into our Q function and into our policy. Um, and so this was kind of more of like a feed-forward architecture and then average. Um, and then the actual optimizer that was used was soft actor critic, uh, which is a, a value-based reinforcement learning method. And uh, you can note that there's a Q function and a policy here, um, and that's kind of indicative of the, um, of the fact that it's a value-based method. Yeah? Yeah, so the question is, how do you choose the, the reinforcement learning optimization? Um, like, is there a reason why multiple of these use TRPO? Um, the, I guess, uh, we'll talk about this in a second too, but the, I guess, things like policy gradients are quite simple and um, like quite simple to implement uh, and are also pretty easy to get to work um, if you give it enough data. Uh, and so I think that these were like two of the first meta RL, black box meta RL methods to come out. And so usually going with simple things that are kind of easier to get to work that don't require quite as much tuning is helpful for that. Um, that said, methods that are on policy tend to be very data inefficient. And so these methods are also extremely data hungry during the meta training process. Um, and so that's, uh, that's a reason not to use like policy gradient based methods and a reason to favor value based methods. Yeah. In meta training, is there a reason we're not sampling in different tasks now? Um, like in order to be a short like form? Yeah, so in, in practice, you will sample a mini batch of tasks on task one. So, so the question is is there a reason why we're just sampling one task here? Um, in practice, you will actually sample a mini batch um, rather than just one task, and then you'll do this update on that mini batch of tasks. So you won't roll it out for so if you have um, k tasks and n episodes in your batch, then you're not going to roll it out for k times n because you need to break the RNN state at the boundary of each task. And so you'll roll it, you can essentially roll it out in parallel 
for each of the k tasks. Um, and so you will eventually get, uh, the, the data that you'll get will be k times n um, episodes, uh, but you do want to make sure that you cut the hidden state at the, at the task boundary so that it's only aggregating information about that task and not about the previous tasks. Um, yeah, so if, yeah, and in general, um, I wrote it as one task for kind of to make the notation simple, but in practice, you will want to use a mini batch of tasks. Um, also, if this, sometimes this policy update, it can be with that mini batch. It can also just sample directly from the replay buffer. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily need to include the data that you just collected. Okay, so I guess one other note about architectures is that um, this is actually just doing feed forward and averaging over individual transitions. You can also um, do an RNN over transitions within an episode and then average across episodes. Um, so you could sort of potentially like mix and match different components here. Okay, um, so let's look at a couple examples of what these algorithms do. Um, so the first example will actually be just the maze navigation example that I talked about before, where we want to be able to learn how to navigate a maze. And we're going to train on a thousand different small mazes. And then we're going to evaluate the algorithm's ability to quickly learn how to solve new mazes, both small mazes and large mazes. Cool. And then um, after the kind of meta training process, we'll look at some videos of what it can do at meta test time. And so here's a video. This is showing the first person point of view. This is showing kind of a top down view of what the agent is doing. Um, this is the kind of the first episode of the, um, the first episode at meta test time, where it's essentially exploring the maze and looking at different, um, different parts of it. And then this is the second episode where it just goes straight to the goal. Um, and so we can probably just try to play that again. So here's the first episode where it's exploring. Um, this is essentially to try to understand the MDP or the maze that it's in. Um, and then it's incrementally kind of updating the hidden state of the RNN based on the training data that it's seen so far. And then at the end of this episode, it's going to keep its hidden state um, the same and then use a policy that can adapt to the exploration episode that it collected in order to go straight to the goal. Um, the system can also work on larger mazes as well. So here's, a, here's an example of a large maze where it um, is currently exploring in the maze in the first episode. Um, still exploring, and then it sees the goal here. And then after that episode, it can very quickly uh, go directly to the goal. Um, so both of these are held out mazes that it hadn't seen during training. And um, in some ways you can think of the first episode as the support set and the second episode as the query set. Um, but in this case, it is actually also just like trying to run things online as well. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then in terms of quantitative results, uh, the, this is comparing um, using an LSTM versus using the kind of the mixture of attention and conv layers. Um, and it's also comparing to just a random policy. And uh, what we see is... Um, I think this is evaluating the, um, the number of time steps that are needed to reach the goal in each episode. And so the first thing that we see is that um, the random isn't doing very well. Um, we also see that generally it takes longer to find the goal in the large maze than the small maze. Um, and then generally we see that it's able to more quickly find the goal in episode two than in episode one because it's leveraging kind of the exploration that it did in episode one in order to find the goal in episode two more quickly. Any questions on this? Um, one thing I didn't show here is the meta training process itself. Those videos were just from meta test time. And during meta training time, it was essentially doing that same sort of kind of two episode process, but across all of these different mazes in its meta training set. And so it's kind of learning how to explore and solve these mazes so that when it's given a new maze, it can quickly solve that maze. 
Uh, Zoom? Yep. Is there intuition about what kind of information the, the navigator is learning, sharing between phases, potentially, if anything? Yeah, so what is the learner sharing across um, mazes. So one thing that you can see is that because it's doing better in episode two than in episode one, it is clearly storing information in its hidden state that tells it about that maze. Um, it's so it's going to basically be encoding something about the geometry of the maze. Um, I don't think that they did any sort of visualization in the paper about what um, whether it's storing the full geometry or just storing like the solution path, for example, to the goal. Um, but that something like that could be interesting to visualize. Did you have a question? Okay. Yeah? Uh, so in supervised method learning, we assume that uh, method training types and meta has passed up from the same distribution. But in this case, I feel like the large mazes are kind of from different distribution with a small mazes. So does the same assumption apply in this case? Yeah, so great question. The question is, um, we, we assumed before that the kind of meta training tasks and the meta test tasks are the same. Um, it seems like now when we're testing on large mazes, there's actually this mismatch. Um, so in general, we generally still need to make the same assumption that training and testing tasks are from the same distribution. Um, qualitatively, they found that the larger mazes were similar enough that it was still able to generalize. I expect that if you gave it like a maze that was 10 times as large, it probably wouldn't work. Um, one reason why it might be generalizing well is that it is still a first person observation. And so the data that it's seeing is still going to be very similar between the train and the test tasks. The like, for example, the quarters are the same size. The visuals are generally the same. Um, and so it is nice that it's able to generalize. It's also possible that in cases where there's a longer path towards the goal, Maybe those are the scenarios where it's not able to do as well. Whereas if it's in a larger maze, but there's still a small path to the goal, maybe it's still able to do well because it saw smaller paths to the goal during training. Yeah. Just to clarify the structure of the setup, um, we make our tasks are different mazes, and then um, within our task, the support set is definitely one, the phrase that is actually good. If that's the case, what policy do we use to get the, um, the data from the people who are to use the same one, or do we use the one that's um, trained after the other one? Yeah, so the question is um, what kind of what is the support set and the query set, and like what policy are we using for to getting the support set, and what policy are we using to get the, the query set? So um, you could essentially, like, you, you can think of it as support set being episode one and the query set being episode two. Um, in reality, it is more like of a rolling online basis where the support set is all of the time steps that you've seen so far, and the query set is the current time step. Um, and so you're actually going to be training on support sets that have lots of different sizes. Um, and then in terms of what policy that you're using, um, in this work, it's actually using the same policy for collecting the first episode and the second episode, which is just this recurrent neural network that takes as input some hidden state that encodes the support set seen so far. Um, and that said, in practice, they could be different policies. And, um, and we'll especially see in the next lecture um, on Wednesday, there are scenarios where you want them to be different policies. So um, as kind of an example of that, say in the mazes, say they're on one of the walls, there's actually a map that like, shows the, the layout of the maze. In that setting, in the first episode, you want to just look, go look at the map. You don't want to like, go figure it out. Um, and so you want a policy that looks at the map for exploration and then uses that information from the map in order to solve the task. Um, and so in scenarios like that, you often do want different, like pretty different policies. Yeah. I have a feeling like these um, black box roles, especially in the, in the context where we got this like the off voice version is way more complicated with respect to the on voice version because it's I have the feeling like, especially in the third model, we kind of rely on this idea of leveraging the stream of data across episodes. Uh, is this okay? Yeah, so you're asking, it seems like it, this is going to work decently well with on-policy methods, but it's going to be a lot more complicated for off-policy methods like like DQN or, or like Q-learning-based methods. Is that what you're asking? Use, for example, with the third one, that's kind of use this idea of the stream of data where the data state is kind of preserved across the sequence. 
Yeah, so there have been successful instances of people training key learning algorithms with recurrent neural networks that have kind of an online update. Um, that said, generally, recurrent policies are pretty difficult to optimize uh, with key learning. Um, and there are, I guess, a couple tricks that, um, that people use. Um, there's this paper called R2D2 that shows that if you essentially store the hidden states in the buffer rather than recomputing the hidden states, that actually works a lot better. Um, that said, it does get more complicated with value-based methods. And um, I can actually show one example of value-based methods maybe before getting to the other question. Um, so uh, in particular, uh, we want to be able to use value-based methods because they're a lot more efficient. Um, this paper is going to look not at navigation problems, but at continuous control problems, where you might want the agent to run in different directions or at different velocities, or be able to adapt to different physical dynamics. Um, and so, um, in general, meta reinforcement learning algorithms are very efficient at meta test time. They can solve the task in like two episodes. But what's challenging is the meta training process might be very inefficient with things like policy gradients. And so what we'd love to do is to use value-based methods or off-policy methods during meta-training in order to optimize for the black box approach. Um, and so I guess uh, maybe I gave this one away, but you would expect off-policy meta-RL to be much more efficient than on-policy meta-RL um, because these meta-RL methods are going to inherit the sample complexity of the algorithm that they're using to optimize the meta-learning process. Um, and so essentially what this, um, what this work did is it used the kind of feed forward and average architecture in order to compute a context, um, just like I showed on the previous slide, and it fed that context into both the policy and into the critic. Um, and it found that if you did something like that, um, you are able to actually solve these meta RL tasks um, much more efficiently than all in policy methods. And so what these plots are showing is the x-axis is the amount of meta training time steps and the y-axis is how well you're able to adapt. And um, the blue curve is, is this algorithm that uses, uh, that builds upon a value-based or all method, soft factor critic. And all the other methods are using policy gradient. Um, and so you see that there's kind of this pretty huge difference in sample efficiency. Um, the the on-policy methods, their asymptotic performance is shown with the dashed line. And so we see that asymptotically, they do actually do pretty well but the time it takes for them to learn is much, much slower than value-based RL methods. Does that answer your question? Cool, did you have a question in the back? No? Cool, um, and then one uh, short digression is that we've talked about black box methods and these actually look somewhat similar to multitask policies. Um, so, for example, in a multitask learning policy, we'll be conditioning on a task identifier. Um, so, for example, maybe we have a robot and we want to stack in different locations. Um, Z might be the location where we should stack. Um, or maybe we want to walk in different directions and ZI would encode the direction that we want to walk. Um, when we have these, um, these black box meta-learning methods, you can essentially view the data or the experience as the task identifier that you're passing into the model. Um, and so it's sort of like the same thing as multitask RL, except where experience is identifying, helping you identify the task rather than the explicit identifier. Um, and then of course you have to figure out how to explore um, to collect information like that. And then um, the, the policy, the multitask policy is um, kind of the last part of that network. Um, so essentially like a multitask policy with your experience as a task identifier. Um, we've also previously talked a lot about goal condition policies and value functions. Um, one thing that's nice about meta RL is that rewards are essentially like kind of a strict generalization of goals. Um, goals can specify reaching certain states, whereas rewards can specify all sorts of behaviors, including reaching certain states. Um, and so Really, the meta R objective is allowing you to adapt to new tasks from rewards for that task, whereas um, goal conditioned RL is allowing you to generalize to reaching new goals. Um, and you can also think of this as K shot adaptation versus zero shot generalization. Yeah. Is a good example um, for coming up with like a reward function? Like, 
after the authors use the time that you took to get the goal in the reward function, which is like a binary successor. No. So the question is, in the maze example, um, what was the reward function? Um, was it only like reaching a goal, or does it account for the time it takes to reach the goal? Um, I don't know exactly what they used. There are a few different choices. One could just be like one for reaching the goal and zero not for reaching the goal. And if you have a discount factor that's less than one, then it's going to encourage you to try to reach the goal faster. Another thing that might be common to do is to use a positive reward for reaching the goal and a small negative reward for every time step in which you haven't reached the goal. And that will also encourage it to get there faster. The last thing that you could do is you could give it a shaped reward that indicates the distance to the goal. Um, that is uh, something that you could also use, although um, that's going to give it a lot more information about where the goal is and whether it's getting closer or further to the goal. It's more like a game of hot cold than, um, than actually trying to navigate and find where a certain object is. Um, on that note, the other thing that I could mention is that the rewards that you use in your support set that you feed into the network, those could actually be a different reward function than the one you use to optimize. And so one thing that you could do that's kind of cool is give it a very sparse reward that it has to learn from in the support set, but then train your meta, train to have your whole meta training process with a more of a shaped reward. And then you could essentially learn how to um, explore and solve sparse reward tasks using more dense rewards during meta training. Okay, um, so to summarize black box meta RL, um, these methods are quite general and quite expressive. There's, um, of course, a variety of design choices in the architecture, um, and they're generally pretty easy to combine with different RL optimizers. Um, essentially, you'll kind of optimize, yeah, optimize the behavior either with respect to some Bellman error objective, like in Q-learning, or with respect to policy gradients. Um, they do tend to be somewhat difficult to optimize, like we've talked about, especially with recurrent networks, you have to backpropagate through this long string of time steps. Um, also, in general, you are, like, like in black box meta learning, you're learning how to learn from scratch. You're not building any structure into the meta learner. And so this also makes it difficult to optimize. Um, and then like we saw before, it's in terms of the data efficiency, it's going to inherit its data efficiency from the outer RL optimizer that's used. And so if you use policy gradients, it's going to be very data inefficient. And if you use value-based RL, it's going to be probably a lot more efficient. Okay, any questions on, on black box meta RL before we move on to optimization-based methods? Cool. Um, so, uh, like we just talked about, black box meta learning methods can be difficult to optimize. And so one thing that might make it easier is to build in the structure of optimization into the meta learner. Um, and so if we want to turn this kind of approach into a meta RL algorithm, we have a few different choices for doing this. And in particular, one of the choices we have is what sort of optimization should we use in uh, the inner loop of this optimization? Um, as a kind of a, a few possible choices, we could use policy gradients, um, we could use Q-learning, or we could also use something like model-based RL. I'm curious if anyone has thoughts on kind of what some of the trade-offs might be for using these different approaches in the inner loop, irrespective of what you do in the outer loop. Yeah. I guess from what we discussed earlier, um, since policy gradients are sampled inefficient, and you might want just a few steps, um, like in the inner loop, you might want to use like a sample efficient method. Um, so, like a few type of approach might be better, you know, sample efficiency is and the same for the other. Yeah, so policy gradients can be very uh, sample inefficient, and so that might be a reason not to use them in the inner loop. For model based RL, if your state space is like, again, kind of similar to the one you said, like, if you want to have a few inner loops, and the state space is super big, if you have to like, try to like, proper empty the model for most of the state space, you can have a few inner loops. Yeah, so if you, 
if your state space is very large and you're trying to like solve the maze navigation example, um, for example, then your model may actually be very inaccurate if your support set doesn't cover the entire relevant part of the state space. Yeah. If the different class are on the same model, you just share the same model. Yeah, so if the tasks all have the same dynamics but have different rewards, then you can actually just use a single model and you don't actually need to adapt the model. Um, and so using MAML with model based RL probably makes the most sense when the dynamics are changing across tasks. Any other points? Cool. So um, those are all great points. Um, I'll overview some of the kind of trade-offs and why we might use one of these versus the other in MAML. Um, so with policy gradients, one thing that's nice is that they are very clearly gradient-based. They very clearly give you a gradient. And so that makes it nice to apply a gradient in the inner loop. Um, they are on policy, and so this means that they are going to be inefficient. Um, the other thing that's maybe a little bit more subtle about policy gradients is that they don't actually carry that much information, um, especially when you have sparse rewards. So say, for example, um, you're maybe in the maze navigation example, or you're just trying to kind of learn something about the dynamics, about the structure of the dynamics in the environment. Then if you look at the policy gradient, um, if you remember, it looks something like um, the gradient of log pi um, summed over your time steps. It looks something like this, times the sum of rewards for those time steps. And if you're trying to learn something about the dynamics and you end up, maybe, maybe you're in the maze navigation example and you collect a trajectory and you didn't get to the goal, so you got a reward of zero, then that means that this is going to be zero and then your entire gradient is going to be zero. And that's really unfortunate because that means you're not going to get any information about the dynamics of the environment if you didn't get any reward. Um, and so this is one reason why policy gradients can be pretty difficult with, with an algorithm like MAML. Um, it's because that you want the inner gradient to be very informative about the task. And whenever you're in a sparse reward setting and you don't get any rewards, it's not going to tell you any information about the task. Um, and about the environment. Um, so it, it can work well with shaped rewards, but if you have sparse rewards, it can be uh, rather problematic. Yeah. Yeah, so if you, um, you can, reward shaping will certainly help, um, and that, that will give you a lot more information. Um, if you give it like a negative reward for everything, um, uh, like maybe this is kind of a fixed concept of like negative t, because maybe you give it a reward of negative one at every time step, this still isn't going to be that informative because um, it's uh, for um, four different episodes, that, like it's not going to tell you essentially which episodes are better than the other um, if you're just getting a reward of negative t for all of your episodes. Cool. Um, so those are the, kind of the pros and cons of policy gradients. Um, now for Q-learning, um, Q-learning actually isn't gradient-based. Um, Q-learning is more like, like dynamic programming. And if you look at the update for Q-learning, it is um, it's something like uh, kind of Q hat of SA. You're trying to make this match. I guess if you look at the loss function, it's something like um, the reward plus gamma times max of a prime of q of s prime a prime, something like that. And one thing that you might notice is if you take a single gradient step on this objective, then this is only going to propagate kind of one time step of information. Because this is um, the state in action at the next time step, this is the state in action at the current time step. And so a single gradient update isn't going to give you a lot of global information about the task. It's only going to give you very local information at a particular time step. And as a result, this means that to get a good kind of update for your like inner loop, you're going to need a lot of steps to propagate information from the future to 
the current step. Um, and as a result, it can actually be very difficult to use Q-learning in the inner loop um, unless you take a very large number of steps, um, but then you have to also backpropagate through that very large number of steps in the inner loop. Um, it is going to be off policy, so it's going to be more data efficient. Um, that said, there's been very few successful examples of optimization-based um, Q-learning, meta-learning methods. Okay, and then one last example is um, for model-based RL, uh, learning a model, if you want to kind of adapt to different dynamics, model-based RL is just a supervised learning problem on the model, and so updates to your model are going to be gradient-based. Um, it's also, you can do this in an off-policy way, and so it can also be data efficient. Um, this makes the most sense when you have a more local update and when you um, have varying dynamics across tasks, uh, but it does um, address some of the shortcomings that we see in policy gradients and Q-learning. Okay, um, so at a high level, um, essentially optimization-based meta-RL can look like embedding an optimization where you choose different objectives for the inner loop and different objectives for the outer loop. Um, next, I'll just go through two instantiations of optimization-based meta-RL so we can look at some kind of concrete examples of actually implementing these algorithms. Um, so the first thing that we'll look at is MAML with policy gradients. Uh, like we mentioned, it can be a terrible choice if you have sparse rewards, um, although it can still be reasonable if you have shaped rewards and plenty of data. So uh, here's kind of, um, to help us uh, kind of remember the objectives, here's the MAML objective, here is the policy gradient objective, which is hopefully the same as what I wrote here. I guess there's also kind of an expectation with respect to pi theta. And so what the meta training process looks like is we will sample a task, we'll then collect data by rolling out our policy, pi theta. This is the policy according to our set of initial parameters. Then for the inner loop adaptation, we're gonna compute a policy gradient using those rollouts by computing this objective, or sorry, this is, this is just the gradient, so by computing the gradient. Then we're going to collect data by rolling out our adapted policy, and this will be used so that we can compute the, um, the policy gradient with respect to that adap adapted policy. Um, and so each of these cases, we're gonna be using a policy gradient both for the inner loop and a policy gradient for the outer loop objective. Yeah. No, just if you does the meta parameters, but um, like if you just try and like classify the like, images based on the meta parameters, you get close to random components, and then it's just when you adapt it, then it becomes fast on this particular task. So, is there any benefit to collecting like any step to the support data by rolling out the policy parameters or the meta parameters versus just like a random policy or something else? Yeah, so the question is, like, for this step two, is there any benefit from using your current policy versus um, a random policy um, or, or some other policy? So the, um, I guess the reason why we might want to use pi theta here is that um, for this to be, like, the correct policy gradient, um, your trajectory should be drawn from pi theta. And if it's drawn from another policy, then this gradient isn't going to be accurate. Um, or as accurate, uh, it's certainly not going to be consistent. It's not going to be something that you will use to like ultimately improve your policy. And so if you do use pi theta here, then you are kind of more guaranteed that this gradient is going to be pointing in the right direction. Um, there are like slightly more off policy, policy gradient methods like PPO. Um, and in those cases, you can potentially use older policies to collect this. Um, but in general, it's going to be cleaner to use your current policy. Um, one downside that you might notice here is we are doing these two steps of collection, and um, and this is going to get pretty um, like sample like expensive in terms of sample efficiency. And um, it's one I guess one thing that I'll also notice is we we you talked about like policy gradient being sample and efficient in the inner loop. 
Because we have to also roll out pi theta at every iteration, this means it's also sample inefficient at the outer loop as well, like at the level of the meta-learning process. Um, I should also mention that there's, uh, this is of course an iterative process. Yeah. Yeah, so do we still pass previous reward into the policy? Um, in this case, no. Uh, the policy is, is just a policy that maps from states to actions. And the way that we're going to infer the task is through the parameters of that policy rather than passing the rewards as input. Um, of course, you could also imagine hybrid methods that are kind of both recurrent and do this sort of gradient-based adaptation. Um, although it kind of in the kind of standard optimization-based algorithm, we're just uh, updating the parameters rather than passing in the rewards. Cool, and then so the result of this process is gonna be a set of initial parameters such that if you explore with those parameters and fine tune those parameters, you should be able to solve new tasks. And so what meta test time looks like is we are given a new task, we collect data for that new task by rolling out our policy with our trained meta parameters. And then we're going to adapt our policy by running policy gradient. Yeah. Well, this well, meta process doesn't explicitly ensure that we get at the end of the end of the definition. Good question. So the question is, um, so pi theta, we actually want two things from pi theta. Uh, we want it to be good at exploration and we want it to be good so that if we run gradient descent, it gives us good parameters. Um, so we are actually asking a fair amount from pi theta. Um, and so the question was, uh, are we actually training it for that first thing? Um, are we training it to be good at exploration? So the, um, it, in some ways it really depends on how you actually compute this outer loop update. So if you're thinking about taking the gradient with respect to theta um, of your adapted parameters, there are two places where that comes in. Um, one is, of course, like um, in the like the log pi thing, which you can, which will be very similar to the supervised case. The other is actually in this expectation, um, and uh, and so ultimately you would like to backpropagate into this expectation. Um, some impl implementations of the algorithm will kind of ignore this. And in those settings, it will not actually be learning how to explore very well. It's gonna assume that whatever parameters are good for adaptation are also good for exploration, which may be true if you have dense enough rewards. In many cases, it also won't be true. Um, there are also approaches that try to estimate, to try to essentially figure out how to backpropagate into this and incorporate the gradient um, with respect to this part um, into the objective. And those algorithms um, can lead to a better exploration process. Um, and so one example of an algorithm that does that, if you're interested in learning more, is called um, ProMP. Uh, and uh, it was written by Ignacy Clavera. Um, happy to send a reference after class. Cool. Um, what do they think that, uh, so I guess we'll look at an illustration of this and in particular, we'll look at the task of running in different directions for this uh, quadruped, uh, simulated quadruped. Um, and so first we can look at the policy with respect to the train metaparameters with respect to the initialization. And this policy, um, this is actually with a variant of the algorithm that mostly ignored this. Um, and so it's just trying to execute a policy that will allow it to adapt in a single step. Um, you end up getting a policy that looks like this, that is essentially kind of uh, running in place. And so it seems like it's ready to be able to run in any given direction. Um, because this is a dense reward task, this sort of exploration is actually sufficient for figuring out which direction it should run in. So then if you take a single gradient step with respect to the task of running backward, you get a policy that looks like this. So it's able to, um, in a single gradient step, adapt its behavior pretty significantly. And then if you take a, a single gradient step with respect to the task of running forward, you get a policy that looks like this. Uh, so we again see that it's able to kind of 
pretty successfully adapt its behavior, um, at least in cases where you have these dense rewards. Cool. Um, so the, that was an example of mammal with policy gradients. Um, we see that it can solve these uh, kind of these simple scenarios um, when you have dense rewards. The meta trading process for this was quite slow, and we actually saw that in some of the plots um, that came before. Um, now let's look at kind of one more concrete instantiation of mammal in meta RL. And in this case, we're going to be looking at um, model-based RL, and we're going to be looking at a scenario where only the dynamics are changing across tasks. Um, we're also going to be looking at um, an online variant, and so in particular, in those previous videos, we saw like you're collecting some episodes and then adapting from those episodes and then getting a new policy. In this case, we're actually going to be, our, our support set will just be in terms of time steps, not in terms of episodes. Great, so what we want to be able to do at meta test time is we want to be able to adapt a model of the environment to the last k time steps of experience. And so, um, for example, if we were kind of um, if we are kind of running around on different terrains, for example, we want to take the last k time steps of our experience of running and use that to adapt our model to um, kind of our the kind of current dynamics of the environment. Um, and then once we have this adapted model, then we can just run planning to figure out some actions that will accomplish some reward. Um, so this is what we want to be able to do at meta test time. Um, and this adap the adaptation process in step one is just going to correspond to fine tuning to running a few steps of gradient descent. And then during meta training, what we can do is we can collect a bunch of experience using planning, using a random policy and so forth. And the support set will be kind of K time steps of state action pairs. This will be D train. And then the query set will just be the next k time steps of experience. And so um, once, once we essentially have all of our experience collected in some way, then we can construct these support sets and query sets just by looking at kind of, kind of chunks of data, chunks of contiguous time steps, and use the first, part, the first k time steps as the support set and the next k time steps as the query set. So essentially different tasks are going to correspond to different dynamics, um, but it, it's just going to assume that the dynamics are locally consistent, and these different tasks will end up kind of in practice being different windows in time. Um, and so, if um, if for example you're running on different terrains, and for like one day you're running on one terrain, a different day you're running on a different terrain, then this will basically create lots of different tasks um, from those different terrains. Yeah. So the kind of window length for um, support set does not have to be the same as the window length. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't have to be the same. Actually, in, in this, uh, it's actually H for the query set and K for the, the support set. Um, you want the support set size to be the same as what you're going to be doing at test time, um, but the query site set can be can be different. Um, you could choose it to be larger in order to get more signal. You could also choose it to be smaller if you think that your dynamics are changing very frequently. Cool. Um, and so with this, we'll essentially be running the same mammal objective, except we'll be using a loss function of, that corresponds to how well your model is predicting the next state given the current state in action. Um, and then I can kind of, if it's helpful, I can explicitly write that out. So um, the loss function will be um, for a task I will be something like uh, f of S A minus S prime. Um, and this will be sampled over um, kind of state action next state for a particular task. Um, so this is the loss function for uh, a particular task. And then um, the mammal objective will be the same as what we saw before, where we adapt our model with respect to the um, with respect to the loss function for a given task on some set of data for that task. 
This is what we want to be able to do at test time when we're fine tuning our model. And then we're going to be optimizing for the initial set of model parameters such that this process works well. And so um, we can write this as uh, kind of evaluating how well this model does um, on kind of held out data from the next k time steps. Um, and so then we'll be minimizing this with respect to our initial model parameters. Okay, um, and then we'll, we can look at some examples of actually running this um, on where we're running on different terrains um, or running with different dynamics. And first we'll just look at a very simple baseline which is only doing model-based RL. And what I mean by that is we're gonna try to fit a single model to all of the different dynamics that the agent is encountering during training. And then at test time, we'll run planning with respect to that single model. Uh, and if we do that in this first example, um, one of the joints of the robot becomes disabled and training a single model across those different dynamics doesn't perform very well. Um, and likewise, uh, in the second example, these different um, platforms have different damping, kind of like a dock, and it isn't able to learn a single model that can model the damping and the dynamics of the robot. Then if you instead uh, run this meta-learning approach where you run MAML, learn an initial set of model parameters, with your last k time steps of experience, you adapt your model parameters and plan with respect to those adapted parameters, um, then you get something that can actually do pretty well. And it's actually, you don't actually see where the adaptation is happening because it's happening basically in real time, um, where it's taking the last k time steps, adapting its model with those last k time steps and planning under that adapted model. And it's doing that at every single time step. Cool. Um, and because this is not policy gradients, um, because it is a uh, model-based RL, um, it's quite efficient during meta-training time. And so this is a learning curve that's showing um, how fast is learning as a function of the meta-training time steps. Um, the yellow curve is showing MAML with policy gradients, and the green curve is showing MAML with model-based RL. And so this illustrates kind of the difference in sample efficiency. Um, and this means that you can also run it on like a real robot, for example. So we can collect data on different terrains. Um, this robot is essentially like hand-built and it, uh, the dynamics are pretty different for different terrains, um, also for different robots. Um, and then evaluate on different scenarios. So uh, one of the scenarios you can evaluate on is take off the front right leg of the robot, which changes the dynamics pretty significantly. Um, and then compare the behavior just with model-based RL. Compared to MAML and with model-based RL, we see that it kind of struggles to walk along the straight line. It falls off to the right. Um, whereas with, uh, by adapting the model to the latest dynamics um, at each time step, it's able to more effectively kind of stay on that straight line. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it, it is um, it's essentially learning a, an average dynamics model and it's also not adapting that model. Um, and so you would expect that um, the average dynamics model isn't going to be very good because it's trying to cover a pretty broad distribution. And also because it's not adapting, um, it's also not gonna be able to kind of specialize for any given dynamics. Um, you can also try to like learn this average and then adapt it. Um, in general, that also doesn't work well because it's not actually trained such that like adapting it with k time steps would work well. Typically, you probably need much more data in order to effectively adapt or fine tune the model. Okay, so to recap the two kinds of meta RL methods that we talked about, um, black box and optimization based. Um, black box methods are quite general and expressive. There's also a variety of de design choices in the architecture and the objective. Um, they tend to be more difficult to optimize. In optimization-based meta-RL, you're building in the inductive bias of 
things like policy gradients or gradients with respect to your model, which is nice. Um, and it is relatively easy to combine with policy gradients and model-based methods. That said, policy gradients are very noisy, um, and it's also very difficult to combine this with value-based RL methods. Um, also, one thing that I'll note about the very top point right here about the kind of building in this optimization um, into the model is that unlike in supervised learning, um, in RL, we don't actually have as good of optimizers for RL. And so this inductive bias becomes less valuable as a result. And so I would say that in general, one of, I think that black box methods are generally more popular, especially with model free RL. Um, and then both of these methods are going to inherit the sample efficiency of the outer RL optimizer. Okay. Great. So that's a recap. Um, and uh, that was most of the plan for today. Uh, next time, so today we covered the basics. Next time we're going to be talking a lot about learning how to explore. Essentially, how do we learn um, a policy theta such that when we explore with that policy, it gives us a lot of information about the task. Um, and then a couple other reminders is that homework three will be due on Wednesday, and then the optional homework four will go out on Wednesday.